I wanted to be number one. I wanted to do, get that big bonus. Also, to me, it was always just a simple dream. I'll just be able to retire in five years' time. Heard it. So the people who really know what's going on with our economies are really, really worried, and that's why we've got a sea of a sea of red. There's blood on the streets. This is literally credit crunch in your face right now. <laughs> this current situation yeah. is worse than I thought. Yeah, and I don't think many people predicted Bear Stearns falling, Lehman's falling. British banks being nationalised, British, uh, sorry, American insurance companies being nationalised. I mean, it's it's actually a crisis of unprecedented proportions. It's biblical, you know, it's biblical what's going on, actually. After university, he went to India. He thought of becoming a trader in importing Indian textiles. Um, we thought we'd possibly lost him to India as he loved India so much. He always believed that you should do a job you love rather than one for money, that happiness is more important than money, um, that you should be able to express yourself and travel the world and, and, and learn about different cultures and, and have different experiences rather than going to work every morning on the tube and sitting in an office. So, yeah, I was just a sort of travelling, you know, left-wing, dope-smoking, beach-dwelling hippie. <laughs> well, of course he needed money. I mean, he had to have something to earn. And he didn't seem to have any specific profession. Now, it's always, parents always let their children to go into a nice profession. Um, but he, he, uh, he wasn't going to be a lawyer, a lecturer, a teacher, a doctor. So uh, he hadn't, hadn't actually marked out a particular profession for himself. My brother, who had got a job in the city and was much straighter and more normal than me, um, said, do you want to have a job in the city? And he kind of said, you make really good money. And I thought, you know what? Instead of doing this traveling thing, I could work in the city for four or five years, save up two, three hundred thousand pounds, and then do what the hell I want with this money. Because at the time, that sort of money seemed feasible and all I needed. Um, so I, without even thinking, I just went, yeah, OK. I was delighted when he got a nice, steady job in the city. He's always been a great risk taker. For a reasonably educated person, I actually had very little idea of it. I knew that they read the Financial Times, they worked hard, and they went in early. I didn't really know what a share price was. I didn't know or, or what dictated a share price or even what the stock market was, really. I mean, I was, for someone who's quite educated, I was pretty ignorant. He sleeps. RWE or E.ON, for example, in Germany, I would look at them. It would be me and my team, six of us, covering the whole of the European utility sector, maybe 30, 35 companies, and then going to Switzerland or Japan or America, sitting people down and say, Oi, I know what's going on. And the, the logic is, if they believe us and trust us, they will do the trades through my bank and we get 0.2% commission. So every million euros that is traded through my bank, our bank would get about 2,000 euros. And the city boy, I would describe him as white, uh, young, uh, male, loose morals, um, and uh, self-satisfied, and good at partying. I am quite a sociable person. I enjoy partying, I enjoy going out for drinks and, and, and enjoy meeting people. And the city is full of so many charmless individuals that even with my limited charm, I, I was, you know, relatively speaking, someone a client would like to go out for a drink with much more so than other people. I also surrounded myself with some very clever people, which was lucky. I, I kind of was quite strategic. 
Nightlife is a great, it's a great way of bonding with clients. If, if a client is thinking, who shall I give my commission to? This guy who keeps on writing lots of notes and does lots of clever stuff on a computer, or this guy who is kind of my friend, it's always going to be your friend. And in fact, Warburg, one of the original investment bankers, said, become his friend, then his banker. And I took that to heart. Sex life, um, yeah, lots of these young men in the business are fairly um, spotty, geeky individuals. And if you can help them be socially more, you know, have a more socially interesting time, they're going to really reward you for that. But I was only, I was asked twice to, to procure prostitutes for clients. And both times I used the same excuse, which was, it's impossible for me to get a receipt from the from this prostitute therefore i cannot claim it on expenses therefore i'm very sorry i'm not that's not possible but strip joints is without doubt strip joints are a major part of of the existence of city boys certainly we saw a change in that um he admits himself for a while he adopted the culture and he became more money obsessed. Certainly for a phase, I thought he's, he became more distant towards us. We would tell him around the dinner table that there were rather more important things in life. I might have quoted, as a good Welsh Protestant, I might have quoted St Thomas Aquinas of seeing everything in the aspect of eternity. There was supposed to be this dealer bloke, I remember, and he... He was called Charlie Chang, which is, is his code name, because Charlie is a word for coke and Chang is. And he, he was also called Martini because he would serve anywhere, any place, any time. And uh, he would go around the investment banks on his scooter and just be, you know, and there were orders being made. Cocaine is obviously, it keeps you going. It's a way of keeping you awake. Um, and B, it's a way of also perhaps forgetting, you know, maybe what's at home, your wife and your children. Um, and being able to, and also just the long hours. I mean, they were working, I don't know, 18 hours a day. I've tried pretty much everything, um, but uh, those days are gone, obviously. But I think one look at these eyes tells you that uh, I've done a bit of living. <laughs> my first annual salary was £24,000, and my first bonus was £14,000. My father, at the time, an MP, really worked hard, public servant, and I think his salary was about forty-five, fifty thousand pounds So in my first year, I was close to what my father was earning. He had extra benefits. My last salary was... I, my basic salary was £120,000, and my last bonus was close to £500,000. And there was a kind of a straight line towards that. I never asked him what he earned frankly, it didn't really worry me. I mean, my major aim as a father was that he would be doing something which he enjoyed. If you're in a trading position, the bank can calculate exactly how much money you're making for that bank. And if you're making, you know, if you make 10 million pounds for the bank, it wouldn't be unusual for you to get a bonus of you know, maybe a million pounds. This is all about the bonus culture. Bonus culture meant people took huge risks with no thought whatsoever about two or three years out. I never thought about anything other than next year's bonus because I didn't know if I'd have a job in two or three years. One of the negative effects was that a lot of these people who were earning so much money had the feeling that they could buy anything they wanted. And so they could not, couldn't just buy objects, you know, it wasn't just cars, it wasn't just fancy dinners, but also people as well, um, that they, you know, could go into a club and just buy a girl, practically. Um, I think that was one of the, the, one of the effects. Um, and generally, it was just, it was just something which, it made the city even more materialistic. It, it, it sort of pushed people who were not earning so much also to their limits, because they felt they had to somehow keep up. We are not, frankly, as a family, particularly interested in money. Perhaps it might be 
argued that um, he had a sort of Faustian uh, relationship with the city, that he had sold his soul. I came into work after having had quite a big night, and um, the guy whose company it was being covered wasn't there, and I had to try and analyse the share price implications of a power station that blew up in Utah. Was that under the influence of coke? I couldn't possibly comment on market rumours. <laughs> I just underestimated the value of, the sh of the, what would happen to the share price. So when the trader called me, I said, you know, I think it's about five pence on the share price. So after the shares fell about 10 pence, he said, great, um, you know, let's buy some because obviously, you know, and I said, yeah, go for it. And then they fell another 10 pence and another five pence. I'm like, oh, mate. And it, you know, it was, it's kind of that sick feeling. You suddenly go, oh no, I've really screwed up here and lost my bank, you know, a lot of money. Um, but yeah, ultimately it's just, you know, you just have to get things in proportion and go whatever. <laughs> there was utter horror. There was a degree of, I suppose, solidarity because there would have been all these people, like Cantor Fitzgerald, for example, and fiduciary and others in the Twin Towers who had died. So there was an element of, you know, people who are doing jobs that are similar to us, you know, not just America or New York under attack, but sort of finance people. You know, Canary Wharf and all the high, high buildings were all evacuated. See. The market is an unsentimental beast. Truth be told, we were close to, to issuing a, a, an email to clients saying, you should buy highly regulated companies which have got a big dividend yield because they're defensive and in this new world order they will succeed. And, and it was a secretary pointed out to us and said, if this email gets shown to the newspapers, you're going to look like such heartless bastards. Do you really want to do that? So, of course, we only did it over the phone. <laughs> it was a time when it's quite clear that capitalism and the excesses and the corruption were, were really in charge to such an extent that even America went, look, we can't have this because we've got 22 th or over 20,000 employees at Enron just going to have to lose their jobs as a result of this company being a total fraud. It benefited London uh, because it led to much tighter regulation in, the, in New York and I know a lot of uh, people who are doing business uh, were, were more worried about setting up businesses in New York and running out of New York because of the much tighter um, you know, transparency requirements and the possibility that the American regulators will be tougher on any transgression than, uh, than, than, than the London location might be. When you look at the boom times in London, which is 2003 to seven, when people were just, the, the stock markets went up about 80, 90% or something, and people were just making vast amounts of cash. You can partly have to thank for that, um, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and, um, and, and the increased regulation in, in the States. In my sector, the, in the UK utility sector alone, over the last two, three years, every single company that got taken over, about five companies got taken over, in the period just prior to it being taken over, the shares started jumping up massively because of everyone buying the shares. And then the company was often, pretty much every time, had to issue a statement saying, we've noticed our share price going up and yes, we do have to admit we're in merger talks or takeover talks. Now that is a tacit acceptance that every single one of those companies was the um, was share price was going up as a result of insider trading. What companies are you talking about? We're talking about AWG, we're talking about Scottish Power, we're talking about Kelder, South Staffordshire Water, um, to name a few. Buy shares in a company, the next day I spread a rumour via the internet, via phones, via my friends, and say that company is going to be taken over next week. The shares start going up, people hear the rumour, they report it on Reuters, the shares are going up, so it must be true. So then you start getting the shares going up even more, until often the company then has to issue a statement saying, no, 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 we're not being taken over. The other way, of course, is through the press. You phone up your best mate in the press and say, have you heard this? And you tell them the story, and next thing you know, the share price starts ticking away. And of course, if the stock exchange or the regulatory authorities call you in and say, 
was this down? She said, no, I've read about it in the press. But what's even worse is called trash and cash, which is when you say, this bank is going to go bust. It's going to issue a statement next week saying it's bust, but you have shorted the shares, which means you make a profit when the shares fall. But we had rumours that these companies were going to definitely go bust. So at one of them, um, HBOS, its shares fell 17%. In, a, in three hours after this rumour was spread that it was going to go bust pretty much that week. You can bet your bottom dollar that a bunch of hedge fund managers had shorted it the Friday before that announcement. And if they'd shorted £10 million worth, they would have made £1.7 million in three hours. These guys are actually helping to create a global recession where people will lose their jobs, they'll lose their homes, their businesses will fail, but they don't care because they have made a fast buck. As the world is collapsing around them, they're sitting pretty. And it is classic, typical, ruthless, nasty, short-term thinking on the part of certain hedge fund managers. Joining us to look at the sector is Durant Anderson, a utilities an analyst from Dresdner Kleinwort. Uh, let's kick off with the actual figures, Durant, and welcome. I know this is the first time for you on uh, the program. The, the overall numbers, what do you make of them? Uh, they, were, they were quite strong. We had profit before tax growth of 9.5%. Uh, uh, EPS was up about 15%. We came to him and said, you know, would you like to write about your life? But it has to be anonymous. And two, it will only work if you really give us the dirt. There's no point in you saying, yes, I want to write about it, and then talk about how you sat at your desk and, you know, we were on Google and looking at how the markets were moving. We want the dirt. We want the real take on city life, the way people behave, the way people spend money, um, the way people are treated by their bosses, uh, the way people behave before they get a bonus, all those really exciting, juicy facts. Well, you know, I'd always had misgivings about my job in the city, always fa found this kind of slight Christian, left-wing, hippie guilt about what I was doing. I did get sucked in. I was then given the opportunity to write this column. I said, if it's anonymous and if it's called City Boy, because what I like about the name City Boy is they are boys. They may earn half a million pounds a year, but their mentality is that of boys. And He's always been a very conflicted character who, in one sense, was very inspired and revved up by his job and very good at it, but at the same time was very kind of disillusioned by how the city worked and the amount of money that was going around and what people did for that money and how his colleagues behaved. So I think he really jumped at the chance of exposing some of these things and writing about them. And I think in a way he just wanted to get, get it all off his chest. One of his very early columns was writing about how people behave when they get their bonuses. Um, so often his colleagues and himself included might be offered a bonus of something like half a million pounds, but still the code in the city was to look absolutely disgusted by that, to walk in and just, you know, look at their boss and say, you know, what is this? It's a complete insult. The column was all about exposing to Londoners, 500,000 Londoners a day, what it was that ran the city and how it was trying to expose most of the negative elements of the city, the insider trading, spreading false rumours, tax avoidance. It was exposing the vice and the, the excesses in the city. That was interesting that someone actually had decided to sort of break out of that mould and who that person could be, why, why he had decided to do that. I was breaking that code of silence. And it is like the Mafia, you know, and the reason they ex exist is, first of all, I think city boys are quite self-conscious about how much cash they earn relative to everyone else. And subsequently, they want to make out like they're doing something so complex and so unbelievably intelligent that, you know, you, you guys out there don't even try and do this because it's too complicated for you. You know, so there's that, there's a whole use of terminology that's really, different and, and, and in fact all we do is push around bits of paper but we do it in quite a clever way. You see if I had got caught by my bank I'm pretty sure they would have sacked me then. I think he did feel there was a danger that he would lose his job um, and uh, he, the more he wrote the more conscious he became that people would recognize it was him.
You can't expect to write a column which says to people, these guys are malicious, greedy, ruthless, selfish people who live in an elite little club composed of mainly young, white, male heterosexuals. <laughs> and then, you know, just think no one's going to react to that. We always knew about it, yes. And we read it from time to time. I didn't read them all, but uh, yeah, no, it was no, it wasn't a secret from us. Most of them were very funny. They were, um, they were escapades, adventures. He got into in the city. It's predatory mortgage lenders in America who are being paid by commission to give as many mortgages out as possible and subsequently gave them to people who ha were, they were called ninjas. No income, no job, no assets. Now call me old fashioned, but I don't like giving people like that loans because they won't get paid back. They're number one. The number two are those horrible bankers in mortgage-backed securities and structured finance who got those crap loans and then wrapped them up with us and sold them on to un unwitting people out there. <laughs> Those nasty bastards, those bosses, pay you more and more money each year. And it is quite hard when you accept the fact that we live in a capitalist world and that to give up a job that pays you half a million pounds a year. Life's really short, you can get run over by a bus tomorrow, and not only that, it's not a dress rehearsal, because I did almost die, and subsequently I just went, you know, you can't do this job anymore. Enough of this. If so I don't think she should be doing all that work. And we're not we're not taking our card down this weekend. <coughs> so I think he was finding it too crushing and against he was not enjoying it so much at some stage. And um, at that time Perhaps for the wrong motive, I was encouraging him to stay. I mean, obviously, we wanted him to enjoy what he was doing. He said he was going to leave after he had his bonus. Now, that's, just, of course, the, the way they all, they all hang around till they get their bonus. They wouldn't leave before it. So we knew it was coming about. Um, and then a big question mark as to well, what will happen after that. I'd get drunk in club bars and someone would go, who do you think that city boy bloke is? And I'd go, it's me. And then they, the next day I'd, I'd go, oh no, I told those two clients. And by the end of it, there were about 20 people who knew. Because mainly my stupidity, but also some people at work would say, you told me that story three weeks ago and I read it in City Boy. Or you used that expression and I read it in that column. Um, as I say, you know, Freud would say I was definitely, definitely hoping that someone would find out and sack me because it's such a hard job to leave because it's so well paid. So on January the 31st, I looked at my account, found out the bonus had gone into my account, so I was a few hundred thousand pounds richer. I had, for pretty much all my career, in the city, I had what's called imposter syndrome. Whereas no matter how successful I was, for some strange reason, I always just felt someone at some point was gonna go, Emperor's New Clothes, that, he's not, he's not a stockbroker. You know, it, and so I did actually feel after 12 years that day, I thought, you've got away with it. And then what I realized is, everyone's just bullshitting everyone else. And all you need to be is a little bit better at bullshitting than everyone else. And if there's one thing I've done all my life really well, it's bullshit. Can't pen me up. I do believe that to a certain extent, Geraint Anderson probably has sold his colleagues to a certain extent, and that a lot of people are very angry about that too. But I also believe that 
the damage that has been done now will lead to a certain change as well. He's entitled to do what he, what he wants to do. Um, he, he obviously didn't feel particularly happy in the city anyway, so he was not, he's not a natural fit for, for a long-term career in the city. Uh, he's been lucky to make enough money that he can probably set himself up for, the, you know, for, for most of the rest of his life, as long as he you know, doesn't invest it unwisely. Um, good luck to him. I don't know how much money he makes, I don't really care. But, you know, don't go criticise the system and then live with it. If he took his bonus, if he'd have walked off before his bonus, I'd have respected him for that, for his views. But don't take the bonus and then turn around and say, this system is wrong because of the bonus system. Uh, be all right. New Are you a hypocrite? Um, I think I have been a hypocrite in some times, yeah. In the sense that I had left-wing hippie ideals and yet here I was at the cutting edge of a system that perpetuates greed, ruthlessness, dog-eat-dog, um, nastiness. Um, I got sucked in by the system. I still think that I'm open to the criticism of being a hypocrite. I and mean, it's up to me to prove to those people that that's not the case. I mean, should I give all my money away? Should I give all my ill-gotten gains away? You know, there's an argument I should. So why not? Um, you have to live. I just spent 12 years of my life earning it. I do give a lot to charity, but as we say in England, I don't like to talk about that. <laughs> and now I'm trying to do some I'm trying to do something back. Oh hope He's not gonna get a job in the city again, is he? Once you've crossed the line in the city, that's it. If you're caught as a cheat, a liar or a thief, you never work in the city again. The city has a very long memory. He is a persona non grata now in the city, I think, in many circles. Um, he has done something, he has overstepped a mark which you really just are not allowed to do. I'm just a city boy, I'm not a lonely pretty boy. Anderson fortsatte på den inslagna vägen. Han drev till och med med sina före detta kollegor. There may be 50,000 jobs being lost. You've got Bonuses are going to be down about 60% according to most of the statistics. And the terrible thing is, is that these people, these bankers, they used to be in the bargaining position. They used to be able to say, if you don't give us a good bonus, we're going to leave and go to another bank. But you've got Lehman's have gone, you know, you've got Bear Stearns have gone. It's an atmosphere of, of from my ex-colleagues, of depression, of panic. And people don't do this job for the love of the job. If they do it to make money, and this time, for the next two years, they're not making so much money, and they're wondering, some of them are wondering, maybe they should do something different with their lives. Damn it. I don't think it's wrong to invest. I don't think companies are evil per se, or capitalism is evil per se, when people are allowed to treat it like a Wild West casino. That's wrong. There's, we're not having a revolution anytime soon. You know? Are you losing some money too? Um, over the last three months, if you include my property price, probably lost about four hundred thousand pounds. Three, four hundred thousand pounds. I forgot to tell. I forgot to sell all my shares when I told everyone for a year and a half to sell theirs. <laughs> Serves me right. You lost the four hundred thousand pounds. Yes. What about your plan to make a living on what you earned during the last 12 years? Yeah, it's taken... I'm going to have to write a few more books. <laughs> so honestly? Yeah, no, it's... It's... It was... It's a problem. Yeah, I, I... I had an assumption that I would be able to make a 10%, 5 to 10% return on my capital and therefore could effectively retire. As things stand now, I've lost a lot of money. <laughs> so you're still part of the system that you wanted to leave? Um, you can't not be part of this system unless you go and live in a tent in a valley in India.